This Pasha's, Pasha's boy, as you surely know, is the end of the Makis. The last three Makis is in Pasha's boy, and then it's the end of, of Golos Mitzrayim. This is when Eden actually left Mitzrayim. <clears throat> and this Pasha also contains the first mitzvah that Eden were commanded by Hashem. This is the mitzvah that Rashi refers to in the beginning of the Chumash, in Breshis. Rashi says that the Torah should have really started from this Pasha because this Pasha contains the first mitzvah that Mitzvah Yisrael that Eden were commanded. And what is this first mitzvah? This is to, de, to determine when Rosh Chodesh is, to determine when the new moon is, to establish Rosh Chodeshim, and to establish the cycle, the yearly cycle. Because you know that in, in the Jewish calendar, since we, we keep, we, we follow them, the months, are the lunar months, are regular months, but the year has to be the solar year because the moon doesn't have a year. Only the sun has a year. The four, the four seasons. So, um, so in order to coordinate the, the, month, the monthly calendar with the yearly calendar, yeah, there's a whole calculation involved. And for this, this is why we have leap years. We have sometimes two others in order to coordinate these two calendars. And this is all part of this mitzvah in, in, that, in today's, in, in today's parsh, the first mitzvah. There's an interesting sikha on the Rebbe, but the Rebbe asks, all right, this is the first mitzvah, and this is what the Torah should have started with because it's the first mitzvah. But we need to also to try to understand how this is the first mitzvah. Why is this the most important mitzvah of the mitzvahs of the Torah? In what, in what sense is this the first mitzvah? And the Rebbe explains that <clears throat> the whole union of Torah and Mitzvahs is to permeate the world itself with godly light. Meaning, not just to be godly and worldly, two separate things, but permeate the world itself with godly light. Worldliness, as is explained in Tanya, worldliness is defined, the principal coordinates of worldliness is space and time. This we learn in Siddhi, and we learned in Siddhi, we discuss it in various instant opportunities, that in the world everything is, is measurable in terms of space and in terms of time. Anything that is not measurable in terms of space and time, that's not world, that's above world. Like the soul is not worldly, it's above world. Um, between these two, of space and time itself, in other words, the first thing that needed to be defined and created was space and time in order to facilitate the creation of world. And between these two, of space and time, Time was the first one. As the Rebbe explains, I don't want to go into great detail on this. And that's why, since that this mitzvah pertains to defining time, this is why this is the first mitzvah. This is, in fact, the first mitzvah. It touches the first concept involved in world. The concept of time. This reminds us quite clearly of what we have discussed in the past, the extreme importance and significance of 
being being uh, careful and responsible for our time. Time appears to come and go, appears to move inobtrusively. We don't even notice it moving, it, it's passing. Space, as we're moving, we see the space passing by us. But time, we don't even notice it. It's completely, completely, we, we are oblivious to time. <clears throat> but we don't realize that time is really the primary factor in our lives. And in order to, uh, to do anything, even in order to think, the first thing we need is time. And if we are careless with our time, we're not just careless with time, we're careless with life itself. Because life in this world consists of time. So just thought I would bring this up because this is very important, especially in our case here, as I point out many times, everyone here is going through in a very dramatic and very heroic, so to speak, change in their lives at, at, at an advanced point in life, an adult state. So every minute really is really very important. Because this is not, in a, you know, this in a, uh, <clears throat> every minute has to be really valued, and it contributes to the to the ultimate success of our venture here. Besides the point that there in, in um, when the Rebbe Rashab established the yeshiva Tim Chetmimi. He gave out a kuntras, he gave out a little pamphlet that he wrote to describe to the Talmidim, to the Talmidim what he expects of the Talmidim. How they should learn, how they should daven, and so forth. And one of the things he writes over there is, he says, watch the time. This is the, the most precious sgula, the most precious means that you have for success. As gula hayeser yikora, that's his expression. As gula hayeser yikora. What? Hayoyser yikora, yikora. So let us proceed. And then the real point that I wanted to speak about is a little further down. So. This, the, 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 the Torah tells us that um, Eden were held in Mitzrayim throughout this period, and even even though Pare was already ready to let him go, but by Chazik Hashem, Hashem hardened his heart. So the last the last few markets, especially the markets in today's parsha, it says that each one of the two three markets, Arba and Choishek. And Marcus Bechoyres. So Marcus Bechoyres, then of course he, he drove the Eden out of his, of his land. But the previous, the Choyshech and Arba, in each one of them, he was ready to, he, he gave in. And he says, um, I sinned and I'm guilty. And Hashem hardened his heart. This hardening of the heart of Pari is, um, you know, everybody has the questions from, from two, from two perspectives, from two um, directions. One is, what's the fairness to Pari? You know, if he's ready to go, to, to let go, so how come, what's the fairness? And the other is, ultimately, he didn't want to get out of the Golas. By hardening his heart, he didn't stay in Golas. Another month. So what's the, what's the, what's the just what's the reason in that? <clears throat> so, since I mentioned it, the, the explanation as far as Pari is concerned is that since that 
that the reason that Pare gave in was not because he recognized and really ac- accepted the higher authority of Hashem. He simply was defeated. And therefore, Hashem used him to teach Yidin the lesson that Hashem wanted to teach them. Because he, didn't, he, he did not, he remained essentially in his rebellion, he remained essentially in his, in his um, um, conviction that he is his own boss, his, I mean, him, his own ruler. The fact that he was defeated, so therefore he, 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 he gave in. So Hashem said right in the beginning of the market, Hashem, Hashem said that I'm going to make a lot of nisim, a lot of makis, in order that Yidin should learn from it. So essentially it is demonstrate for Yidin, for the Jewish people to demonstrate Hashem's presence with them and how Hashem um, 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 <coughs> leads them. What is the so therefore, there is, a, there is a, a lesson in this for the Jewish people. And this is the point which I wanted to. Hashem held over the Yidin. Another month, another month, because each Makir was a month, as you learned from previously. And Yidin were anxious to get out. And then later on, um, um, Moshe, um, Hashem told Moshe, and Moshe spoke to the Eden that they should go and they should um, borrow from the Egyptians, from the Mitzrayim, they should borrow clothing and, and, um, and jewelry and, um, and um, vessels, whatever it is. So the Gemara says that Eden said to Moshe, we are more than willing to forget, to forget and forgo all the riches. We don't need the riches. We want to get out of here a day earlier. And yet, Hashem held them over. So you would think that Hashem was not in a hurry to get Eden out of Mitzrayim. Held them over another month, another month. Yet, later on, when Marcus Bechoyris took place, after the last Marcus, Marcus Bechoyris, so it says, Bahi Bachatsi Halayla, that did occur, this occurred smack in the middle of the night, not approximately one night, but it was intentionally, the Hashem divided the night, so to speak, in a manner that is so precise that the human being couldn't even, couldn't even calculate that precision, that level of precision. Exactly in the middle of the night. And that's when there was a Marcus Bechoyvis, and that's when the Eden were finally freed from its life. And it says in Sforim that if that Eden at that moment, at that moment when they were released, this was imperative that they should be released at that moment. And it says, as soon as the moment came, Hashem didn't hold them over in Golis, not even one moment. And that's where the night was divided at this split second. In other words, on the one hand, he doesn't seem to be in a hurry to get even out. But when the moment came, the split second counted. And it says, that if the Eden, that the Eden at that moment were at such a, a level because, because of all the suffering and all that went through in the last, in the 200 years that they were in Mitzrayim, <clears throat> they were at such a low ebb, such a low level, that if they would have stayed another moment in Mitzrayim, then they would not be redeemable anymore they would not be able to get out to become free again. They would have sunk into the klipa, into the impurity of Mitzrayim, and not be able to, 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 free, to free themselves from it. So here he is holding over, Hashem is holding them over to such a critical moment, 
and on that it, it becomes a critical moment that it has to be this particular second. And if it and and, and before that he doesn't seem to be in a rush. There is great significance to this. It's quite obvious. And I would like to speak about it and because it's significant then and significant for each one of us. The Yidin in Mitzrayim, as you've learned, were subjected to the lowest level of treatment. They were not just enslaved, a slave who works and produces something. They were treated, as it says in the Chumash before, and we discussed it, beforech. Beforech means intentionally looking for ways to, to break their spirit. Not just to get benefit from their work. To break their spirit, that's what for means. And it's not on over, over this period, Yidin completely came down to the bottom, to the, to the bottom, so to speak, of a human spirit. They lost completely any spirit. There was nothing left. And that's why, had they been held over another moment in Mitzrayim, they would have lost completely their identity. They would have sunk, so to speak, like one sinks into the, into the sea, sunk into Mitzrayim, and it, it, they, would, they would cease to be an, an, a separate nation. And then it would be impossible to get out. You take them out, but they would be, they would be Egyptians. Nothing would happen anymore. What was the purpose of that, of getting eaten to that low level? And this was all we know was all planned. This was not something that happened that happened uh, because of, of some circumstance. It was all planned way, way in advance. As Avram Ovino was told, what was what's involved? <clears throat> we know that ultimately Golos Mitzrayim and the Ulas Mitzrayim, Kamgar of Mitzrayim, ultimately permitted and facilitated, prepared Eden for Kabbalah's Atoir, for receiving of the Atoir. This was basically, this is the ultimate plan. Receiving of the Atoir does not only mean, as we will talk, I mean, we get to it, but in general, does not only mean to have rules and regulations and, uh, and you know, modes of, of more of government. Receiving the Torah completely redefined the Jewish people. It became a people that is not defined by, by a worldly presence, but defined by a godly, by a godly uh, uh, force, by a godly uh, definition. This is <coughs> what we see what is the first dibur, the first same thing that the Hashem said by the Aserahs Adibris, by Martin Toira, the Ten Commandments, what do the Ten Commandments start with? Excuse me? It's a Mitzrayim. I'm your God who took you out of the land of Mitzrayim. So you would think, I'm your God who took you out of the land of Mitzrayim. It's not such a such a mind-boggling piece of information. I mean, he knew that they took and came out of Mitzrayim. You know, you would think that the first commandment would say Shema Yisrael, or um, or, or some other. What what what's 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 the content? What is the significance of that commandment? I'm your God who took you out of Mitzrayim. The significance of this is, and this is what the whole preparation of Mitzrayim facilitated. Normally, as we spoke about before, in the world, the orientation is that, first and foremost, I exist. There is a world. This is how we see the world. We see the physical world. And then we start asking, after all, where does the physical world come from? 
Why is it here? What does it stand for? And anything that we learn and explain about the physical world becomes an explanation to the physical world. But the basic existence, the basic orientation is still that there's a physical world, except we can explain what it is, explain what it's for, and how you're supposed to live in it. But your basic orientation is <coughs> there's a world. <coughs> Who created the world? Okay, God created the world. But where am I living? I'm living in the world. So therefore, when Yidin came to Mitzrayim, they were a nation. They were a nation, a small nation, 70 people. But how did they come to be? They came to be basically in a natural fashion. There was there was Avram, there was Yitzhak, there was Yankiv, and Yankiv had had their children, they developed in a natural way. So essentially they were, so to speak, members of the, of the, of the world. They had their own ideas, but all of the ideas were uh, things that they understood as people of the world. What is the <coughs> principle of Torah? What is the principle of Yiddishkeit? The principle of Yiddishkeit is what it says in the very first Dibur of the Aseras Adibur, so the Ten Commandments. That what is the basis, what defines the existence of the Jewish people, not the fact that they have, that they, they are people amongst people, but defines them as a people is that Hashem took them out of Mitzrayim. This is the beginning of their existence. This is, why, this is where they start. This is the starting of their history. Not anything before. How was that facilitated that Hebrews should be able to relate that the starting point of their history, of their nationhood, is at a time when Hashem took them out of Israel. Which means that in this physical world, Hashem came and made them right here started a new a new ent entity called the Jewish people. It's not something that Hashem's presence with the Jewish people is not something that is an add-on to the fact that there is a people and Hashem takes care of them. No, this Hashem's presence is what makes them. Because in their, in their experience in Mitzrayim, during the time that they were slaves in Mitzrayim, as we said before, they lost completely every sense of personal identity, every sense of personal of morale, of personal uh, pride. They were they were they, they came to a point of nothingness. And if they were held over in the time of one more moment, there would be nothing left. They would sink into the inside. Hashem. So then Hashem took them out at that moment. And therefore, this moment is what defined their whole existence. This moment what defined their whole existence. And this is why Hashem held them over one more month, one more month, held them over to the point where they would be, they would be at, um, uh, prepared, they would be at the moment where it could be said, they could recognize that their whole presence, their whole existence is in the fact that Hashem took him out, nothing else. There is no combination of world and godliness. There is only godliness. That's what defines the Jewish people. This is what it means that the Jewish people have a toy. And this is why it needed to go through this entire process of enslavement. And then Hashem has to come at the very last moment in order to give them this godly definition of what they are. This made the Jewish people, and this made the Jewish people forever, forever for all eternity. Because the very name of Jewish people meant that Hashem made them right here in, in, uh, as a new entity in the world. This principle
that in order to absorb toir, in order to absorb toir, absorb toir means that one can relate to toir to Yiddishkeit, not as a secondary, as a secondary aspect in his life. I am whoever I am, and I also know Torah. I also am this, I also am that. But that Torah should be the very basic definition of his life. That is something which has a very precise process, a very precise requirement. Just like in Mitzrayim. Of course, it's not, not comparable to the type of experience that they had in Mitzrayim, but there is something similar in terms of the process itself. Just like in Mitzrayim, it is not something that one can come. <clears throat> Hashem could have taken Eden to the des- desert and said, Oloi Hashem I'm your God, take my Torah. And Eden would have accepted the Torah perhaps. But there would be, the Torah and them would have been two separate things. It wouldn't have been one entity that the Torah defines who they are. And the same thing repeats itself in every person's life, especially one, a person who has to shed, so to speak, uh, <coughs> uh, things that, that one absorb from the world in order to become one with Torah, there is Yiddishkeit, there is a very precise requirement. Requirement, need. It says, <coughs> this is as Azoya actually, it says that in, in Mitzrayim, Eden were sub- subjugated to working with Choymer Ulvenim. Choymer means mortar with clay, or the venom and the bricks. In today's goals, in our goals, in order to come out of this goals, we also have Chaymer Ulevenim. But this Chaymer Ulevenim was substituted for a much more pleasant, for a much finer, nicer Chaymer Ulevenim. But we also have Chaymer Ulevenim. What is that? So the Gemara, the Zoya says, Chaymer means Kalva Chaymer. Kalvachimer, everybody knows what Kalvachimer is, right? Kalvachimer is a method, of, a method of logic that is employed in Gemara. <coughs> or Levenim, Levenim means bricks, and the word Levenim also means white. So it says Levenim is an allusion to Libun Hilchase. Libun Hilchase means to clarify halacha. You learn a halacha, and it's never. Clear right away, there's always a whole bunch of questions. Until you get a final conclusion, a clear halacha, you have to go through a whole, a whole suffering, so to speak, a whole effort. Nothing is clear. This labor in Torah, that Ayid has to labor in Torah, not just he reads it and it's clear to him. The fact that we have to labor in Torah this is the substitute for the labor that Eden did in Mitzrayim. And this labor is what prepares every one of us. It prepares the Jewish people in general for the Giyul. But this has a very profound effect on each one of us. So that if Ayid should be prepared, should <coughs> to come out of his own goals, which means that he recognizes that his life and Torah is a synonym, is one and the same thing. It's not two separate things. For this, there is no shortcuts. It doesn't mean that it has to take 200 years, but it does have to take work. And we can't... And the, and the requirement is so precise, and the requirement is so exact, and so important, so deep, that it cannot be a moment earlier. Just like in Mitzrayim, 
Hashem was very anxious, wanted to even get out of Mitzrayim. And even for sure were anxious to get out of Mitzrayim. But they had to be held over to the very last moment. Why? Because if there is any aspect left that is not part of either sky, that mixture, that impurity remains an impurity. And a person can go out and receive the Torah and be and be a religious Jew and and, and there is something be remain gnawing, so to speak. Gnawing means bothering him inside. Some doubt, something remains that is not part of it. And that can go on for, for years. In order to be assured that one is truly coming out of Mitzrayim and he is truly receiving the Torah, one has to go through the, the process of choymer ulevenim, of, of laboring and learning, everyone here has to labor. <laughs> Even, you know, you're talking about adult people starting to learn olive base. I can't imagine a, a, a bigger labor than that. It's a, it's a suffering. An adult person who is, is an educated person who, who, can, who can think and, and, and learn a deep thought, all of a sudden he has to start learning an alphabet and a new language. And, you know, it's, it's, it's labor. And then even somebody, once you learned it to somebody, it doesn't have to go through that to start learning a completely different discipline, a completely different thought process. It's labor. And we are anxious to, okay, let me, but what's next? You have to understand, this labor is what prepares us, each one of us, for, for Kabbalah Zatayim. For receiving of the Torah. Because receiving of the Torah does not mean only, well, I have it in, in my hand, I have it in my pocket. Receiving the Torah means absorbing it, then it becomes part of me. I don't feel strange in it, I don't feel uncomfortable with it. I can carry it, you know, wherever I go. In, to assure that, Hashem himself held over the Jewish people in Mitzrayim more and more and more and more until they were absolutely ready. And then suddenly he takes them out. This is, I, I feel, <clears throat> an extremely important message. And both, it's an important message and it's, and it's a source of encouragement for each one of us here. Because everyone here goes through labor, he has to work, as I said, intellectually, so to speak, at a lower level than his capacity. Because of his language barrier and because he's not familiar with the whole process, with the whole logic and all that. And this is a difficult thing for an adult person to do. And he gets disappointed. He learns something, and because he's not used to it, he learns, he learns, even if he thinks he understands, and then he finds out he doesn't really understand. Once he understands, the next day he forgot. It's, it's a whole labor. And one can, can easily be disappointed. And this episode, this part of our story, of Etzias Mitzrayim, where we see that it's yes, that the first dibur, the first commandment in, in the Aseris Adibur is, is that you should know that what defines you as a people, that's the first dibur. What defines you as a people? The fact that Hashem took you out of Mitzrayim. Not the fact that you have parents and grandparents and great grandparents. That Hashem took you out of Mitzrayim, that defines who you as a people. In order to come to that point where you recognize that your home, your home at Sias is the fact that you are bound up with Torah, there has to be a process of labor where one, in effect, 
loses and gives up his personal status, his personal uh, level of, of uh, understanding, and he starts learning from scratch. Just like Choymer Bilvain. We start learning from scratch. And this is what changes us completely and brings out the best, brings out the Nishomer, the God of Nishomer in us. So that we turn around, after a while, at first we see that it's labor, after a while we turn around and we see, ah, I got the Torah, Hashem gave me the Torah, it's mine. How much ever I know of it is immaterial, but I have it, I can relate to it. I can relate to it, I really feel an affinity with it. I feel in one with it. It's not just for show what I know, but I, I really feel that I, I have broken through the barrier of Mitzrayim, and I came out of the goals. And all of a sudden one realizes that in his, just in our thought process, not only in what we do, of course we do what it's said in Shekhan but that's, that one can learn very quickly. What do you do? How do you do it? But to, to feel at home with it, to feel comfortable with it, to feel that, yeah, this is my thing. For this, one has to work, the man has to go through this labor. It would seem like, you know, when is it going to end? When is it going to happen? So we find also in this Pasha that when it happens, it happens suddenly. One moment. It's not a question of when. It's a question of the, of the depth of the labor itself. One time, people were standing outside of the Rebbe's room, what's called Ganet Natachni. They were standing around and, um, outside the Rebbe's room, and they were discussing between themselves what's going to be like when Mashiach will come. In other words, how will Mashiach appear? In what, what's going to be the so to speak, the episode that's going to introduce Mashiach's appearance. They were discussing it. Apparently, the Rebbe was in his room, and the Rebbe overheard their discussion. And then suddenly, the Rebbe opens the door, and he comes out. And he says, just with the same, with the same suddenness, that, that I came into the room, with that same suddenness, Mashiach will come. Here, on, on a, a sudden basis. It's not going to happen, you know, gradually. On a sudden basis, here, here he is. Because once he's not ready, then Hashem doesn't hold him over for one second. It's not something that, that, that will have to do with graduality. But to get ready is very important. And the getting ready is precisely this, this preparation, this labor. So, just want to make sure reflect on it. Every time that we have to fight with ourselves to get up on time, fight with ourselves of, of saying moida aniyim, washing megal that's that's labor. That's a choymer That's labor. This is the labor that prepares us. It seems simple, but that is what breaks us away from Mitzrayim and brings us into, into Hashem's, Hashem's, uh, Hashem's nation and defines who we are. Soon, in a couple of uh, Prokim in Tanya, <coughs> you will see that there is an expression in Tanya when the Tanya says, which means that every time that a person has any kind of battle with himself, 
battle, huh? Middle. Battle, fight, war. Ah, fight. Any kind of battle with himself. And he overcomes. He pushes away the, 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 the creeper, pushes away the Itzahara. He says, every little battle, no matter what, no matter what, I read this post. I'm not sure I read it right. I see that I made a mistake. Ah, oh, I don't care. I'll, I'll go right. I'll go on. I don't have to. No. I'm going to go and read it over again. Because I know I made a mistake. I'm saying every little battle is a battle that <coughs> actually go, breaks the, the clip and gets the Eid out of, out of his golos and Take breaks him into into Hashem's world. Every battle, no matter how, how trivial or how serious. I know <clears throat> in Yeshiva, in the time for, for my time, I had Chaveri. who, you know, we all sat and learned. And there was one particular Bacher who worked very hard. He didn't have such a great head. And he, but he, and he worked very hard because he didn't such a, have a great, great head. He had to repeat something many times in order to understand it, in order to remember it worked very, very hard. And he would learn beyond the say that, you know, into the night, in the morning, because he, he worked very hard. And this went on for a while. How many whiles can it be? You no, know, a year, two years. You know, he didn't become an old man. You know, a bucket. Then all of a sudden, I go over and I talk to him and learning. And I don't recognize the boy. I don't recognize. He knows everything all over. His mind is open. You understand? <laughs> it's like a change, a, a, a fundamental change in the person. This is what happens. This is what happens because ultimately Hashem grants us. Hashem relates to us. Hashem gives us the Torah. We have to only prepare for it. But in order to prepare for our life as hidden, and for our life in, in, in the English world, we have to know that we have to break away completely from the Klippus Mitzrayim, from the impurity of Mitzrayim. And as long as we have that impurity with us, hey, it's going to drag us down. It's not going to allow us to get into Yiddish God. And this is why we have to we have to go through this labor. Once we break away from it, then we find all of a sudden we are out of Mitzrayim and Hashem comes to us and speaks to us. This is all allegorical, of course, but we, we have a totally different relationship. We learn a word Torah, it, it, it sips in, it, it makes sense. I, I, I can see an affinity with it. We live with it. And then, when it comes to establishing our lives, to build our homes, we are not fighting, we are not trying to get direction from, from the clip of Mitzrayim. We get direction from a Jewish, from a Torah perspective. We can build our homes on, on a Torah basis, not only in terms of what's right to do, what, what do, what not do. But the whole, the whole ruach, the whole spirit in the home is a Torah spirit. We know how to build a Jewish home. A Jewish home is not built on the basis of do's and don'ts only. There is a whole, there's, there's a spirit, there's an neshama. There's an neshama in a Jewish home. And we have to, we have to, we are able to bring it. Because our home, it is, is defined by Torah.
So I would think that this is an important lesson for each one of us from the episode of Etzias Mitzrayim. Etzias Mitzrayim, Hashem really wanted to get Eden out of Mitzrayim, but he held them over until they were ready. Each one of us wants to get out of Mitzrayim, but we have to know we have to really get out of it. Not just learn what it looks like, what things look like outside of Mitzrayim, but actually get get the Mitzrayim out. So I want to encourage you, explain to you. The harder we work. The more, the more, the more deep is the effect of our work. The more careful with where we are, time. The more careful with how, with with. Our. It's not. In other words, this is not comparable. What you're doing here is not comparable like to going to school, going to college, where the whole thing is to know what it says. It's a totally different effort. Totally different requirement. It's a. It, 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 here is an, a need to to actually relate to every word and to feel for every word and to feel the Kedusha. And Hashem's help will work hard and at first it will be uncomfortable and then afterwards it will become sweet and Hashem's help will all be successful. In one second. That's what happens. That's what happens. In one second. I have seen myself right here in Seagate and in other instances. I've seen myself, you know, Bocher laboring, 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 and all of a sudden, yeah, he's ready. And, and just maybe a week before that, he wasn't ready. He still had, had ideas from before, from different, and all of a sudden, it dawned on him, oh, I understand what you're talking about. This is how it happens. This is how it happens. And because it's such a profound change, that's why it requires hard work. This is the substitute for the Choymer of Venim that didn't work in Mitzrayim. So, lots of Hatzlocha and Brocha. Work very, very hard because that's the source of the other. There's a lot more behind that. There is a whole discussion whether, in fact, they were obligated to eat matzah at that time. Because they were only commanded, in Mitzrayim itself, they were commanded to eat matzah only with the Korban Pesach, which was before they left, that evening, before they left. But the next day, According to most opinion, they weren't even commanded to eat matzah. They weren't able to eat anything. But they continued to eat matzah because they didn't have a chance to. They didn't have a chance to rise. You understand? So what's the meaning behind matzah? What's the meaning behind a cracker instead of bread? <laughs> it's not a cracker. No, the I'm not saying like the union behind matzah. The union behind matzah is that it's. That it's not uh, that that it never became homens. That's that's something we learn. That because it because it, it never became homens, it never rose. It's a new from beetle. It's not gaiva. It's not gaiva, right? Than it's supposed to be. It's not gaiva. Right? Many many things by Kabbalah. That's right. 